come and do, do the best we can on this side. Pray you'll be with the speakers of the hour, the things they have studied. You will give them a ready remembrance of those things and um, that they will portray those to us in a way that we can take those in and uh, apply those to our lives. Ask that you will forgive us of those sins that we've asked forgiveness of. Strengthen us in those things that are upright and good. Defeat us in those things that are contrary to your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We are continuing our study of the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 16 this morning, and we're going to hopefully be working through it. We're working on uh, through our way through Paul's second missionary journey. And so I wanted to here show you again on the map. Uh, we're starting here in Antioch, and that's where uh, the base church where, where Paul begins. He's going to go up overland. Uh, he doesn't take Barnabas. Where does Barnabas go with John Mark? He goes to Cyprus. That's right. All right. But they're going overland, strengthening the churches they had been to, places like Derby, Lystra, and Iconium. And then they're going to start making their way further west. And we're going to see the uh, vision that Paul has in Troas, make our way uh, into Europe, mainland Europe, to Philippi, the foremost city in the region. And then also into chapter 17, uh, down to Thessalonica, to Berea, and then to Athens in Acts chapter 17. So uh, we'll try to see how far we can get to in Acts 16 and 17 this morning. Oop, there we go. And this again shows you and shows you the itinerary of the places where Paul met and uh, went on his mission trip. In some places, they're only going to be there for brief stays. You know this when you go on travel occasions, uh, sometimes you do layover in one place, you just spend the night in a hotel, and you keep on moving. Uh, I think about that in Acts chapter 17, where it talks about going through Amphipoli Amphipolis and uh, Apollonia. Uh, in that first verse, it doesn't say anything about those cities until they come to Thessalonica. Let's go ahead into Acts chapter 16, and again, real briefly go over verses 1 through 5, and keep in context uh, in your mind of what happened in Acts 15. There was a big blow up and uh, council that met in Jerusalem, and they were discussing how much of the law of Moses to Gentiles have to be amenable to. Well, we answered that, how much do Gentiles have to be amenable to the law of Moses? None. And then none is the correct answer. All right? There's a lot of things that carry over from Old Testament uh, doctrine into New Testament and the law of Christ. But the Christians are under no uh, part of the law of Moses. And we can talk about, you know, how many of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament. And that's fine. But under the law of Moses, we are not under. And they uh, make that very clear in Acts chapter 15. Uh, especially things of circumcision. However, when we get to Acts 16, here comes Timothy, a good, devout young man from the areas of Lystra and Derby, and um, Paul has him circumcised. Why does Paul have Timothy circumcised? We just, we just talked about this in Acts 15. All right, Talking about his parents. His father, the text says, was... Greek, but his mother was Jewish. Right? And this shows you some of the, uh, the cultural blending that happens in, in every place, but especially when it comes to religious things. Uh, the Jews had a certain custom of the way in which they carried on in their lives, but then you have the Greeks in the way in which they carried their lives. Greeks did not uh, circumcised for religious purposes. And so many of their, their people would not have been circumcised. But Jews, however, it was a sign of their accepting of the covenant with God. And so Timothy was not circumcised uh, when he was born, but he is circumcised later. 
But why does Paul uh, make Timothy become circumcised? All right, culturally speaking, there's going to be some people he, uh, Paul and Timothy are going to come in contact with. Timothy was a young, faithful Christian, all right, but uh, they were going to be doing mission work in a mixed culture, but especially in a Jewish culture. Uh, and Jews would have outright rejected Timothy uh, if he comes in and tries to teach in synagogue or something like that. Uh, because of the father, Greek, uh, Greek father, he would have been well known. Um, <laughs> we'll just go ahead and answer this. <laughs> go ahead, Stacy. The, the answer I have is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they're checking under the hood or what, but um, I, I don't know. Uh, and, but for whatever reason, they, this was a sticking point that they felt like Timothy would have um, uh, hindered that, that ability to go into these places, especially in synagogues, uh, to be able to give that testimony. Yes, sir. Uh, there was a, a New Testament scholar, his name was Philip Siegel, um, <coughs> who uh, answered that question. He said that, um, and he was of a Jewish background in the sense, he said that that was not done by examination. Not done so, by examination. Um, the, uh, and of course, there would have been the public baths, and then uh, the word of mouth would have spread and so forth. Furthermore, uh, verse 3 says, in this particular case, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. But, uh, again, I was told that uh, it was not done by examination. Yeah, and maybe even think about some things of what it's like in our culture, all right? Um, you have someone who's grown up in a very worldly manner, and he's a well-known figure in a community, all right? Um, how does this guy go about, I guess, proving himself that, he is truly converted to Christ. Obviously, you've got to uh, look at the way in which he lives his life. Even uh, in the Old Testament, Jews, just because they had physical circumcision, doesn't mean they were automatically guaranteed to be right with God. Uh, and so uh, that would come over time as people examine the changes that happen in, in an individual's life. Wayne and then Josh. Well, saying, this, saying all that, saying this, is uh, I've known grown men who have gone through that. And that's not a fun thing. And uh, the other thing is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 20, and to the Jews I became as a Jew. And, uh, but I'm still, I was thinking the same thing Stacy was. Who's checking this stuff out, <laughs> you know, taking him in a back room and or whatever. But it also states there in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 3, yet not even Titus who was with me being a Greek uh, was compelled to be circumcised. Now, I personally think, and it's just me personally, that was just a choice of Paul. That was his idea. I, th I hope Timothy had a choice in it, uh, too. Well, yeah. he did. And, <laughs> and if I'd have been Timothy, I'd say, well, I think we might want to regroup somewhere and think about this. And I'm, you know, but uh, it, it's, <laughs> it, it happened, and uh, it had its purpose, I suppose, but. But when you do Timothy, I'd probably be Timothy when Titus had uh, was, was in that situation and went, wait a minute, I went through this. Why is Titus not doing this? I don't know. It's just, it's just one of those things. It don't mean anything, but you just think about it. You just made me think of another thing. Um, let's say, just for example, I'm coming to you, Josh, I'm sorry. Um, let's say you have a very salty military sailor type guy. And he's gotten all kinds of tattoos when he was in the military. Now, he's converted out of, uh, uh, he's converted to, to Christ, all right? Um, and he's got all these tattoos on his body. Right? He may be, have tattoos on his body that he's ashamed of. Right? 
Um, does he have to remove those tattoos to be in right standing with God? Might he do those things just so he doesn't offend anyone? He might. But he's got an option to do those things. All right. And uh, like Wayne pointed out here with the circumc circumcising of Timothy versus the not circumcising of Titus, they show, like George points out from time to time, these are biblical options. One does not make you more righteous or less righteous with God. And um, that's drawn out here with, with Timothy. All right. Um, there's certain things, customs that people have. If you're going to be working with a particular population, you might need to think about what are the, the cultural things uh, so as to not uh, unnecessarily offend, because uh, the, the gospel is going to be offensive enough. Let's go to Josh and then, and then George. Three points real quick. Uh, I know on my birth certificate, um, it, it, it actually would say whether I was circumcised or not. Oh. In those civilized areas around the Mediterranean, they, especially in the Roman culture, they were very good at keeping records. And the Jews, of course, were very astute. They wanted to know your lineage, what yeah. tribe, and who was your dad and your grandfather, and how far you could trace it back. So, uh, so if Timothy wasn't on those rolls, then they would know yes. um, by, his by his birth records or the circumstances of his birth, which may be assumed since his father was Greek that they wouldn't have held to those things because they didn't place as much emphasis on his mother. Uh, which, um, secondly, I think about two things. Number one, how all those men felt when Abraham came back to the tent after his first meeting with God and said, boys, this is what we're going to do tonight. <laughs> and, uh, and then secondly, the, the amount of loyalty that it would take to your tribal leader like an Abraham to do that as a grown man. Secondly, uh, how, how deeply Timothy took his mission um, it's kind of like uh, someone told me, I think it was someone here in the group that they knew, a, uh, or one of my customers said that there was an FBI undercover agent that took on face tattoos and neck tattoos to infiltrate these MI gangs on the border. Um, yep. And so the you know th and th so that's a very dedicated man. Dedication but to the job, dedicated to yeah. the mission, or, or whatever those things. Um, all those great, great comments, Josh. And thank you, appreciate it. George and oh, Dennis and then George. Sorry. Well, this is this is relatively simple. Uh, when I was working with my tools and I had my toolbox over in the corner or wherever it was, and <coughs> somebody come along and help themselves to it, um, and if I asked them, did, you know, did you take this? It's a matter of telling the truth or not. So if I knew where all my tools were at in the box. So if I went over there and looked and it wasn't there, then he lied. So then I locked the box. Some so people will <coughs> engrave different things. Well, that that's true too, but right? you, you still have to go over into their box and look. <laughs> but uh, it's an uh, honesty thing. If somebody says something and they really don't do it, Timothy just wanted to be able, somebody, a Jew would come up and say, are, are you a Jew? Right. Or are you circumcised? And if he lied, well, he lost all standings with anybody around. Of course, Absolutely. that one Jew is going to go around and tell everybody he's not c circumcised. Right. Or he lied, one or the other. George and then uh, Ralph. Well, we are, given, we are given answers as to why Timothy was circumcised and why Titus was not in the context. In uh, Acts 16, in the case of Timothy, it says, uh, because... The, they all knew that his father was a Greek. And uh, then as was indicated, for the principle in 1 Corinthians uh, 9.20, so it was a matter of expediency in this case. Uh, wher whereas in the case of uh, Titus in chapter 2 of uh, Galatians, we see that uh, Paul says in that context, now in that context the Jews were insisting, requiring that this option be implemented. So they were miscategorized, the Jews were miscategorizing the, ac the option as if it were a, an obligation. And in that context, uh, in Galatians 2, Paul says, I will not give in for a moment. So that's why he didn't in that case. So we are given information as to why 
in those two contexts. Yes. Um, and so what George is pointing out and some other people have referenced, Galatians is a good commentary on this issue of especially circumcision, but keeping of the law of Moses, these Judaizing teachers coming in behind Paul saying, oh yes, it's Christ and the law of Moses. Uh, and so Galatians is some good reading to, to supplement some of the things we're, we're looking at here. Brother Ralph? Okay. On one of those mics? Yeah. I, okay. Thanks, Rob. All right. Let's notice real quickly, let's go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter, or excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter uh, uh, 1, and then also in chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 1, and let's look at verse number, number 5. He says, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which first dwelt where? Grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded, is in you also. Aren't you thankful for godly mothers? Aren't you thankful for godly grandmothers who take the time to pass on that faith? Uh, In 1 Timothy chapter uh, uh, 2, People get all up in arms about women and what their role is and things in the church. Do they, t- do women teach? Absolutely, yes. The first and primary teacher in the home most likely will be the mom. And we need to promote godly mothers. We need to support those women in the things in which they do. Are they leading in a public service like like you have uh, here or in um, the worship palace. No. Okay. But there's different roles that we play. And these are crucial and key roles uh, in the development of uh, our young people. But notice also in 2 Timothy 3 and verse number verse number 15. From a childhood from, from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are make, able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. And then he talks about all scripture being given by inspiration of God. Think about it this way. Um, you have, you know, think about all the way back to cradle roll for children and women who are essential in uh, working in the cradle roll and, and a lot of our younger Bible classes. The stories that they're getting, all right? The cradle roll, you think about the days of creation, you think about Noah, you think about Jonah, some of these uh, the crucial stories that they get when they're a child. The childhood that Timothy had, did he have the New Testament scripture? No, but he had the Old Testament. And if you give a child the essentials from the Old Testament, then you plug in the last uh, piece of the square of, of the puzzle, which is Jesus. And it's able to make them wise unto salvation, right? So give them that foundation of faith. And then there will come a time when now you've put the the capstone piece on all these things to make that picture come all together, which is Christ. And they can have that salvation. Children in Bible classes is such a good thing. Uh, I don't think there's an issue or problem maybe in the modern uh, time, but there was once upon a time in, in the churches where they struggled with things like Bible classes for younger children. Uh, and there were some people who would object and say, well, we're not a unified body and when we have children uh, uh, doing Bible classes or other things like that. Um, yes, they're divided for some specific instruction for their level, which is a good thing. But we also have worship together where a child sits right next to mama and daddy and they see what worship looks like in a corporate setting. Now, I'm not for things of divided worship when it comes to we're going to have, you know, the children are too annoying or whatever reason, and so we're going to have children's church uh, over there, and then we're going to have the grown-up church over here. That's, that would be where I think there's some wisdom uh, that's needed of we need to show uh, there's things on their level, but also we need to have worship time together uh, as a group as well. Was there a hand? One of the things for um, those of us particularly that grew up in the church or even a church, 
uh, that you don't think about until like Casey went where he is out there in South Dakota and then like pretty much here you could you know definitely here in this congregation you could grab any junior high or high school kid and you could kind of start you know somewhere down the road with the story but with them I mean you got junior high and high school kids and creation Noah and the ark Jonah and the whale David and Light. I mean that's just I mean they don't have a clue what you're talking about I mean you literally have to start with the high school kids back at in the beginning God created I mean and go from there so that's something that uh Casey had never faced for sure here in the United States I mean possibly possibly on some of the mission trips but um it's yeah that's just something that uh that we are so blessed with in the church that we don't realize how blessed we are. Another, another one of the blessings that we don't realize how blessed we are. Yeah, um, I think this has been a cultural movement in our country. You're seeing more and more young people growing up unchurched, so to speak, in, in any sense of that. Um, and where do you start with teaching the gospel to people? We got to start where where what they know, and when they have that foundation, it's an easier thing to connect all those pieces together. Uh, it's a harder thing, like we're going to see in uh, Acts chapter seventeen with Athens. These guys, the the Greeks, they they believed in many gods and things, uh, and so you got to start where where people at, and it's a, a, an easier thing sometimes when it starts with these children have grown up and they know the stories. My favorite way of explaining the gospel is the, uh, the story of Jonah. How long was Jonah in the, the belly of the fish? How long was Jesus in the grave? Three days. And Jesus refers back to Jonah, and he says, just as Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be. And that's the, my favorite way of explaining the gospel. And if someone knows that story, I can take them from there to Jesus. And so you have that foundation with people uh, that you uh, that you use. All right, let's keep going here. Um, there, Timothy's helping Paul to uh, uh, deliver the decrees from Jerusalem, talking about not binding those things. Uh, and then verse number five. So the churches were strengthened in faith, faith, and increased in number daily. Let's move on then to uh, verses six through ten. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia, the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And when they had come to Myasia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Myasia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. I want to go back real quickly to that map here. Okay, so they're going here. They want to go up uh, into Asia. Now, when they talk about Asia, this is what Asia is. Ephesus down here, Philadelphia, Sardis, all your seven churches of Asia are in this red region. They pass through Galatia here. They go into Phrygia. They can't go into Asia. They cannot go up into Bithynia and Pontus. That would be the Myasia. Oh, excuse me, Myasia over there. I'm sorry. Uh, they weren't able to go into these different places. And so then uh, coming over to Troas, that's where they get that Macedonian uh, call. Why were Paul and his company prevented from going to these other locations? Yeah, me neither. I don't know. The Holy Spirit uh, prevented them. Um, and there's some vagueness in that. And I think about the plans that we make from time to time. And somehow, in some way or another, the best laid plans, right? sometimes go uh, uh, in different ways than you might have expected. And we're not given all the details like we would like of why he went this way or that way. Um, but it says that they weren't able to go to those locations. 
Now, verse number 9 is a vision. It says, a man of Macedonia. Again, we want to know who is this man? What is this vision? Uh, we just don't have the information like we would like. But notice in verse number 10, you then see, now after he had received the vision, immediately we went. All right. So what does that tell you? It's all they, 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 and now it's we. What does that mean? I can't hear you, Sony. I'm sorry. He who? Luke. Luke is now coming on board with the, the mission. Now, some scholars have said the guy in the vision was Luke himself. We just don't know. Uh, from uh, We don't have enough information to know uh, if he was this man from Macedonia that he saw. Um, but for whatever reason, either he's in Troas or he's come on a ship uh, from across the Aegean and come to, to, to where Troas is with Paul. But now Timothy is joining that mission. And so these we sections, as they're called, these we sections in chapter 16, also in chapter 20 and 27, uh, is when Timothy is writing and talking about his, his, his experience firsthand. Uh, and Timothy is right there with him. He's not getting um, the journals or anything of Paul. He's right there with him. All right, let's go on in verses 11 and following and see how far we, we get before I want to stop. Verse number 11. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to uh, Samothrace, and the next day we came to ne ne Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a foremost city in the part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in the city for some days. Now, foremost in verse number 12 is a little bit confusing. It's not the biggest city in the region, and it's not the, uh, the, the most seemingly prominent city, but it is the most northern city, and it's along a very, very significant pathway called the uh, Ignatian Way. And you can still go today to uh, parts of, uh, of, of Macedonia and Greece, and you can still see those Roman roads. And these Roman roads would have connected Paul to all those different places in the ancient world. And so the, uh, there, there is some archaeological evidence of military bases that were here where they could send these troops out wherever they were needed quickly. Rome was able to dominate the region because of they were able to send their troops very fast. Through the Mediterranean, they dominated the seas but also on their roadways uh, connecting the, the empire. But Paul uses those for missionary work. All right, let's keep reading verse number 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worship God, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she, she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. So, so she persuaded us. Now think in your mind, we're going to come back to Lydia and, and the discussion. What are the characteristics that you like about Lydia? What are the things that, that you like about uh, what is recorded about this woman? Uh, and just keep those in your minds and think about them as we, we go through them when we get to the discussion questions at the end. But also in verse number 16, there's an incident that gets Paul and Silas in trouble. Let's keep reading uh, here. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed a spirit of divination and she met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. Now, I have a question here when we, we look here. Uh, let, me go, let me go here, and we'll go back to those slides in just a minute. 
why is Paul mad that this person is um, saying, hey, these guys are servants of the Most High God. They're, they're proclaiming the ways of salvation. Uh, isn't that what Paul's trying to do? Right? Who's, who's the message coming from? Is that what? Yeah. It could just be, well, based upon the context, uh, to build off what she was just saying, that um, sp yep. the spirit of uh, div divination that um, this this l young lady had, um, it was not based upon um, what edification. It was more of a, um, I guess you could say, um, a annoying. As Paul was annoyed, but. I'm losing my train of thought here, but um, it was not uh, for edifying purposes. It was for it was basically to uh, to almost it would seem as if she was trying to undermine what they were doing, um, but the the spirit working through her it would seem was trying to work through her to undermine what they were doing or perhaps even maybe distract them from what they were doing. Yeah, there's annoyance on Paul's part, and coming from which source uh, is something of question. When Jesus uh, met demon-possessed people, sometimes the demons are crying out, and it seems like they even acknowledge Jesus and his identity, but Jesus oftentimes is recorded, uh, he made the, the, the spirits be silent, all right? Um, God sends his messengers in his way, and there's not going to be where, um, you know, God and Satan are doing the same work. Uh, and so something on here, and, and again, we want more information, uh, at least I do when I, when I look at it, but um, the source of it, but also maybe they're doing this in an underhanded thing, or the timing of these things is, is off, and she's just following around. Um, I think about my own kids when we're driving somewhere in the car, and they're having this conversation, and there might be a, a, nothing wrong with the conversation, but they're just going so loud and, and being annoying that we turn around, hey, you need to be quiet, all right? And then I know that's a lesser uh, example. Wayne and then George. Well, it, it's not the message, but where the message was coming from. Also, if you look at verse 18, what's it say? Many days. Many Christ days yeah. this woman was doing this. Now, like you said, that's like going on a road trip. <laughs> with your kids or grandkids, and they're like, when are we going to get there? What's happening? Well, I'm hungry. You know, let's do this. So, yeah, I can understand, Paul. It's like, okay, first thing, you need to be quiet. I'm trying to teach, or I'm trying to do this or that, and all you're standing around is just saying the same thing over and over and over. Yeah, that would become very irritating for sure. Yeah, definitely. George? I think it's more than that. Um just a psychological annoyance. Because uh, notice in verse 17, this girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God. Well, uh, according to Hebrews chapter two, verse four and Mark 16, 20, the signs accompanied uh, the spokespeople of God during this time to convince or to uh, confirm that what they were saying was from God. And uh, she's confusing the situation here because she is not uh, performing a miracle from God, a sign from God, even though she's affirming what's being said. And uh, so it's, it's vital that, uh, that signs accompany what Paul was preaching so that the people could know that these are from God. Here you have a phony situation, which is interfering with that uh, uh, divine affirmation that is found in uh, Hebrews 2, verse 4, and, and uh, Mark 16, 20. They, they confirm the word. And uh, we don't want some um, non-spokesman of God interfering with that process. I believe that that's what's happening here. And, and maybe this, um, have you ever seen like celebrities or sports athletes um, give praise to God. I'm thankful that they do those things. But sometimes when you know a little bit about their lives, they're not the best spokesman for, for, uh, on God's behalf. Um, and so maybe, maybe that's 
part of it too. Um, one, one thing that I also thought about too, and then we'll come to Tony. Uh, we are in Europe. We are in pagan countries. We are in the polytheistic country. So they're servants of the Most High God, all right? And they could be also getting in trouble, which they're about to get in trouble. Um, the way in which the Greeks and the Romans looked at Jews, and especially Christians, they thought of them as atheists. Why would the pagan Greeks and Romans think of Christians as atheists? polytheism, the pantheon, right? Uh, all the different gods. No, it's a rejection of all those things. There's one God, and the king is not Caesar. It's Christ. And so they're going to get in trouble in, in this chapter and also in chapter 17. Uh, but the way in which the pagan world looked at them, they thought they were the atheists. Tony? Well, you kind of said what I was thinking. Her manner of life, they knew who she was. They knew um, that she, like I said, to me it's demonic that, that's um, going behind them and following them and her reputation preceded her because she would have drawn a crowd anyways but the message that she was saying was true but they wouldn't have believed it coming from her because they knew her reputation they, and so uh, when she tried to proclaim the true God, like you said, their gods, they had many gods so it would have undermined the true God's message. Yeah, and, and I think it's going towards a way of getting them in trouble, especially when now my pocketbook's hurt as well. Brenda. And like you said, the prophet that was coming to them from what she was doing, uh, like it says in 16 about her, you know, she brought them much profit by her fortune of what she was doing. So these things weren't for the glory of God. No, and it these goes things on. were for her masters. And the 19th that says their hope of profit was gone. Yes. So. And uh, she has multiple masters. They're a very sad situation this girl finds herself in. Well, I, I find it strange that Jesus um, himself at the well with the Sumerian woman did not say, do not tell anybody about our conversation but she went to her town and was telling everybody in town she was almost a, uh, an apostle for Jesus right there but yet she had a background I don't know Check better or worse than right. the lady uh, praising Paul so I'm not sure why Paul had wanted the annoyance everybody gets annoyed all yeah. the gnats around my when I'm eating or something like that, it's very annoying too. Right. I would say one key difference in those two, um, the woman in John chapter 4, this is of her own volition. Now, this one here, um, she's being possessed by uh, an evil spirit. And um, like I said, it, it's not the easiest for me to uh, see exactly why, and, and we can make some um, inquiries of maybe why, why Paul got so annoyed, um, but there is a difference, I think, here in Acts 16 versus John, John 4. Jimmy? Vince, uh, in the King James, it, instead of saying annoyed, it says grieved. And in today's language, if you think annoyed and grieved a little bit different. Are, are, are different, and I, I think it would be fair to point that out. Um, you know, not to split hairs, but was he annoyed or was he grieved? Did he feel sorry for her and put up with this and then cast out the demon? Because honestly, uh, as was said earlier, you know, different things can annoy us to this day. Uh, if a person is on medication, we know it's not that real true person. Sure. And she's possessed with a demon. Therefore, is that really her? Is that her personality? Uh, and maybe Paul saw that. Uh, and again, if we're splitting hairs here, you know, the true message is the true message, as we all know. Um, but I just found it interesting that in the King James it says grieved, it does not say annoyed. Good point as well. Um, anyone have any other translation? Grieved or annoyed? 
King James, New King James up there. <laughs> uh, um, that might be one worth a, a word study on whatever <coughs> Greek word uh, that is, because a lot of times there's some nuance there, what Jimmy's pointing out. Um, NIV, no, trouble. Trouble, okay. Um, all those things kind of come, come around the same idea. Um, there's an, another one in Acts 17 where Paul is, it says, is he annoyed? Are he stirred in his spirit? What does that really mean? We can uh, dive into that and uh, draw those things out. So, um, and she was in a, in a very sad situation. Let's keep reading verse number uh, 19. When the, her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them to the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or, to, or observe. Then the multitude rose up uh, together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them in prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So you see the complaint that is made. Uh, verse number 20 and 21. They exceedingly trouble our city. Well, is it the entire city that's troubled? No, it's just them. Just certain masters who uh, got hit in the, wa uh, in the wallet. Verse 21, they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or to observe. What do you think the accusations here about them teaching customs not lawful for us? They're talking about some other god or gods. or you know, they're, they're confused at this. Uh, going on and these guys they're outsiders they're Jews trying to uh, put on us of what we ought to do you see this, this kind of uh, playing cultures off of one another now you're going to learn later on Paul and Silas are both full Roman citizens and so uh, keep that in mind as we as we look at these things um, but they are there the multitude rose up and they had them beaten with rods, with many stripes, and they're in the innermost part of the jail. And again, we'll look at what kind of rights did a Roman citizen have? Uh, was there any trial to see if these men were guilty? It was a very hasty action. All right. I wanted to show you some uh, pictures here from, from uh, Philippi, or not Philippi, um, yeah, Philippi. Uh, this is the Roman road, the nation way. Uh, they move in their troops around easily. This is the river that Lydia would have been baptized in. Now they don't know the specific location of where she was baptized. But this is a, an Eastern Orthodox or a Greek Orthodox uh, church that built a uh, baptismal site there. So you can literally go and see a public uh, baptismal, the people would go down in the river. You can see seating on this side to watch those events uh, occur. But Lydia would have been baptized in that river. Here is a, a theater that is in Philippi. The, the Greeks and the Romans, they love going to the theater. And you can see these are really, really neat structures. Um, just like, you know, we go to the movies today or something like that. Uh, these you know, seeing live action plays and things uh, there from Philippi. This is a really neat one. All right, this is a bathroom. All right, you see the stalls in the bathroom? And then these young men, they're sitting where this would have been a public restroom. All right, you go down the steps, you go into the bathhouse, uh, the bathroom, and you go down there. And you, it's hard to see, but there's, there would have been running water down here that would have flushed the contents away. All right? And so there you can see those men uh, sitting there on the, I thought that was silly. Um, and you can, there, you know, I think there was on the description, this would have been here and also on this wall as well. There are a lot of these latrines there.
All right, we'll go ahead and pause right here, and we will talk about the, uh, the midnight happenings uh, in, next week. Any other last questions or thoughts today? Ms. Tony. I think it was more with the uprising because that being Roman citizens, I mean, being Roman culture, they, they worship many gods. So I was, wouldn't you think it was more of them causing an uprising that was going to cause those officials to come down there is the reason why that they were basically put in jail? Rome was very much concerned about peace. Right. Right. You're not going to make a riot. You're not going to uh, anybody who's this kind of rabble rouser or whatever. Uh, they're not going to like. And so, if you're accused of those things, um, these Romans take it very seriously. Correct. And uh, even in this occasion, without the uh, without a, a hearing or anything, they just drag them, beat them, put them in jail. Uh, you dumb Jews, why are you coming up here stirring up trouble? That's what that's what's in their mind. And they're going to be very afraid afterwards because they did this to Roman citizens. Exactly, well. but it wasn't the, the fact that they were, you know, issuing these this new bringing this new God into it. It was more like you said to keep the peace. So and that's and why we beat them. Getting the people riled up are those masters who have been hitting their pocketbooks. Correct. So then they're dragging them. They're getting people stirred up, and then they go and they beat. Yes, sir. Last comment, and then right here, Rick. Oh. Do we still have uh, body spirit around people? Do we still have uh, the different culture when we go to another country and you preach the gospel and you tell them everything they do is evil? Is it the same thing that happened years ago? And I think we need to consider, uh, Paul talk about that in Romans 14. We need to consider, because something might be a sin for you, is that a sin for somebody else. It depends how the person live it. And this tolerance is you know, explained very clearly in Act, uh, uh, Romans 14, uh, where we can find the same situation. And now we need to find out uh, what is essential for you and for me today to be saved, not to go all that story, because those story happen for a reason. They were in the Bible for a reason, and the reason is what is important for us today to see how we can use that to see, because a lot of people who killing people here today in America, they, the bad spirit uh, occupied them to do that. But we need to be clear on that uh, spirit, uh, you know, who, de who destroy our country everywhere in the world today. Yeah. I think we have a better job to do as a Christian. Yeah, Thank we you. Have to make sure we're, we're
Registration forms are in the office or online. Youth group Valentine's party in the Fellowship Hall on February the 11th at 6 p.m. Please RSVP to Becky Shoemaker if you plan to attend. Um, just says spring gospel meeting. So, all right. We'll get a date on that. I, mean, I know there is a date. It's just not on here. Men's breakfast at South Florida Avenue is on the 18th at 9 a.m. Please see Phil Fife if you can help with the cooking. Also, there will be a Senior Saints meeting at 10 a.m. Tuesday, this Tuesday in the Fellowship Hall. Want to continue to keep the Smith family in our prayers as well as those who are on our sick list. Do not have any additional. Josh Cantrell announced Wednesday evening that he and his family will be leaving to go to a new work near Atlanta. We hate to see him go, but pray for him and his family as they make this transition. And then we want to pray for the elders and the congregation here as they seek a replacement. Elders and deacons meeting next Sunday, the 12th. If you have anything that would like to be brought up at the meeting, please let one of the elders know. If anyone is interested in sharing a cabin at PTP this summer, let Brian or the office know. If you recently brought food or meals in the fellowship hall, please collect your dishes. They will be in the utility room, which is this little hallway right directly behind me here for a limited time after today very limited after today <laughs> so you got about an hour after today they will be moved into the old pantry room which I don't even know where that's at currently there is a table with some lost and found items if you or your children are missing anything please check it out currently there is a table where is this table All right, in this, in this room right here behind us, up next to the, just to the left, just to the left of the, uh, <laughs> just to the left of the water fountain there, and in front of the black shelves where the food was that you could take. All right, so there's uh, some things there. If you're missing anything, check that out. That's uh, all the announcements that I have. We will now enter into our worship service. I'm going to go check out that table. <laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. Number 694 will be our first song this morning. 694. Say verse 1, 2, and 5. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tears. Oh. 
Hit number 315. Hit number 315. After someone will have our scripture reading and opening prayer. We'll sing all three verses. I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days And watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high I'll live with Him forever in glory by and by Oh yes, I'll live in glory by and by I'll tell and sing love stories there on high, there with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I want to be of service along this pilgrimage. Day by day I travel, I'll keep him ever nigh, and live with him forever, in glory by and by. Oh yes, I'll live in glory, by and by and by. I'll tell and sing the story, there on high, there with my dear Redeemer, there's no more. Pray with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, for this hour of worship we have before us. We thank you for your son Jesus, for his death, burial, and resurrection, and the love that he has for each one of us. We thank you for all the members here at South Florida Avenue. Thank you for the elders and deacons and preachers and all the good work that's being done here. We pray for the elders that you will continue to strengthen them and give them wisdom in the upcoming decisions here. We thank you for your many blessings each and every day, Father, the, even the simplest things of just a breath in the mornings, Father. We continue to pray for the Smith family. We pray you will comfort them and get, this, get them through this difficult time. Be with those who, who are going through difficult times right now that you will comfort them and be with those who are sick, suffering. We pray that you will be with them and bring them back to us, if it be your will. We ask that you be with us through this hour of worship, that you will help us to clear our hearts and minds and focus on the things that we hear this morning, focus on you. We thank you for all these things. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is going to be from Psalms 46. Psalm 46. Verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Psalm 46, 1 and 2, and it reads, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea.
confusion your songbook and would like to mark the song of invitation, it's going to be hymn number 655. 655 will be the song of invitation. And our song before the lesson this morning will be hymn number 282. 282, if you're able to, please stand for this song. We'll sing all, three, all four verses. I know that my According to surveys, death is our fifth greatest fear. It follows public speaking and embarrassing yourself publicly. Now, admittedly, uh, public speaking is tough, and chances are real good you will embarrass yourself. You will absolutely say something in the time you did not mean to say it. You will choose the wrong words or words you will embarrass yourself. But public speaking and embarrassing, and embarrassing ourselves should not surpass our fear of death. If men don't fear death, it's simply because they don't understand it. Death ends our opportunity to accept God's grace. And death ends our chance to be washed in the blood of Jesus. Death ends our hope of hearing the Spirit's invitation to come. Death brings with it the threat of eternal damnation to everyone who dies outside of Jesus. Therefore, it is unreasonable and uninformed to fear anything other than death if you don't have Jesus. 
It remains a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10, 31. If one has not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, they should not eat nor sleep. They should not tarry nor delay. They should not seek peace, comfort, or joy. Instead, they should use all their resources to seek the Lord and find him. For if death gets to them before they get to Jesus, the combined vocabulary of humanity cannot adequately describe their state. As we think about life and death this morning, faith is also associated with our discussion. The word faith is mentioned over 250 times in the Bible. Of course, depending on the context, the word may mean different things. It could be talking about a person's individual faith, or it could be talking about the gospel system of faith, Jude 3, how they contended for the faith. Faith keeps us connected to God. It's what allows us to see the sun behind the clouds. And the focus, our, the focus of our study this morning is going to be on our individual faith. The Hebrews writer says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11, verse 1. He goes on to say, and without this kind of faith, it is impossible to please God, verse 6 of that chapter. What's so interesting about life and faith is of everything we thought uh, that would never come to our house, it has a way of being there. And after we've gone through these experiences, we are never again the same. After Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, they were never the same. After Job lost everything, he was never the same. After David was betrayed by his own son Absalom, he was never the same. After Jonah was thrown up by the great fish, he was never again the same. And on and on and on throughout the entire Bible. And we often ask ourselves many questions in life, and we never seem to find the right answers. What kind of life will I have to live? What kind of car will I drive? With whom am I going to marry? Where am I going to go to school? What will happen to me in this situation? The questions are never ending because life is ever changing. We wake up with our lives looking one way. and By the time we go to bed, we have an entirely different life. Because life is constantly changing, so are the questions. The questions we ask at 15 are not the same questions we have at 25. The thoughts we had at 25 are not the same we have at 35. We grow and we mature into different people. We mature and so does our relationship with God. The Bible teaches us so clearly that there must be a continuation of growth in us and from us. This growth is not only inward, but it's also outward as well. With so many questions and not enough answers, we often feel helpless not knowing what to do. And just when you think, and we utter the words, man, this can't get any worse, it somehow has a way of getting just a little worse. What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when life hurts? What do you do when you want to quit? We would need the rest of today and days after trying to find the answers to those questions. In life, there will be two or more challenges that will make you stop and make you question your faith. No, there are indeed some things we go through in life and they really uh, cause us to step back and ponder. But we're not talking about those smaller things in life. The things that really grip your heart and snatch it out of your chest. These events are like nothing else we'll ever experience. For however large or small the event or trail is that is before us, the response should always be the same. Consider these two questions this morning. Am I ready for my faith to be tested? Am I ready for my faith to be shaken? Shaken is defined as, or at least one definition is, it means to be disturbed. It is a biblical reality this morning that we all will go through something. Something will shake us or disturb our lives. And as you read the Bible, it is clear faithful men and women of God live their lives having been disturbed. And as you read the Bible, it makes it clear again from Genesis all the way to Revelation, no one left this world without some scars. I would be foolish this morning to minimize the things that we go through, just foolish. And as older generations will say, I'm not even going to sugarcoat it. 
we often hear the question, how bad is it? Do you want the good news or the bad news? Just how bad is it? But with that in mind, what can we do? What can Christians do knowing that life is unfair? What can Christians do knowing that life is hard? What can Christians do when they have more questions than they have answers? What can Christians do when they feel as if the walls are caving in? What can Christians do when there really is nothing to do? We trust God. That is not just a saying we read on some box or some post. That is a reassurance we remind ourselves of that we get from God. Ironically, this morning, trust is tied to trials. You may be asking, how is that possible? I thought trust was connected to God. We have faith and trust in God, and that's true. But in order for our faith to increase, trials, they are a part of that. James will record, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when ye encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, it produces endurance. And let endurance have perfect results so that ye may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James makes it so clear and concise. The faith that is practiced and the faith that is obeyed, it will lead us closer to the heart of God. As Peter writes to the brethren there, Peter says, Beloved, think not it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Peter says, but rejoice. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, he says, keep all rejoicing so that at the revelation of his glory, ye may also rejoice and be overjoyed. First Peter 4, 12 and following. You see, this morning, my faith is all that keeps me connected to God. Many today, many don't know what to do when their faith is shaken. Many run and they flee. Many run so far from God that they don't know how to get back home to God. They have gone so far into the far country and can't grasp the concept of reality. We have more bills than we have money. My marriage, it isn't going the way I had hoped for. My children are not doing well. I just got the call from the doctor and he says it's not looking good. The boss just told me, hey, man, we appreciate you, but today is your last day. What do you do when your faith is shaken? What do you do when the world is falling apart? In Psalm chapter 46 this morning, we find the answer to that question. The Bible there says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Verse 2, the psalmist says, therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Verse 5, God is in the midst of her, so shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. Verse 6, the psalmist says, The heathen rage, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come and behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob, he is our refuge. Point number one this morning, we need to remember the God that we serve. We need to remember who God is. To just say that we have to remember, it doesn't really grasp the severity of the statement. We are not just remembering the good times and how special that individual or this job or this thing has made us feel. We are remembering God. But God is what? Be more specific. God is everything, friends. I think sometimes we look for there has to be more information to just that statement God being something 
Yes, God is good. God is great. God is merciful. God is kind. But the psalmist is going to begin this psalm the same way he's going to end this psalm with God. What better way to begin and end a sermon than talking about the God in heaven? When our faith is shaken, we have to remember God. The creator of the universe is the one who has my life in his hands. Growing up, there was a song we used to sing. We often still sing it today. He's got the whole world, what, in his hands. As Paul stood in the Areopagus in Mars Hill, he made a declaration about the God they did not know. He says in Acts 17, verse 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, Paul says, the Bible says, Luke records, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God there. What you worship in ignorance, Paul says, this I proclaim to you, that God, God who made the world and everything therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temple made by man's hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all people life and the breath of all things, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. What else, Paul? Having determined their appointed times and their boundaries to their habitations. And in verse, 40, verse 27, Paul says that they should seek God. If perhaps they might feel around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Paul makes it so clear. Paul says, here you are searching and you're looking and you're reaching for God and he's right there. The God Paul proclaimed in Morris Hills, that God who made the world. And hold on to this phrase, and all things therein. There is nothing that is outside of the power and the scope of God. In Mark chapter 4, here you have Jesus, God in a body. He's on this sea. He's with his disciples. They go awake him. Carest, not, carest thou not that we perish. Here you have a man, God in a body. He goes and he talks to the waves. He talks to the storms and they begin to cease. And their conclusion is what manner of man is this? That even the winds and the seas obey his voice. Even those who were closely associated with Jesus often overlooked the fact that he was God often overlook the fact that this is not just a man. This is not just flesh and blood like we are. This is God in a body. When our faith is shaken, we must remember that God is everything for us and to us. The psalmist says God is our. That makes it personal. This is a personal relationship. This is not just the God of this world, though he is, Acts 17. He is also personally my God as well. The relationship we have built with God is the one that allows us to trust in him the way that we do. We all know how that goes. The more you grow, the more you endure, the more you learn with a certain individual, the more you begin to trust them. And the more information you are giving over to them, who better than to give all that information and trust to other than the God in heaven. In Psalm 118 and verse number 6, the psalmist says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What shall man do unto me? In verse number 8, the psalmist says in, first, in, in Psalm 116 there, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. When we read Abraham's offering or sacrifice of his son in Genesis 22, we can overlook chapters 12 through ch chapters 21. Many things arise in the life of Abraham he overcomes that can only be attributed to the one with whom he trusted his life with. In Genesis 22, the Bible there says, God asked Abraham, his friend, to sacrifice his son. And we often say, man, I want faith just like that of Abraham in Genesis 22. That if God was going to ask me to offer whatever it was that was so close and dear to me, I would just offer and give it up to God. But you can't overlook chapter 12 through chapter 21. From chapter 12, we read the call of Abraham, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. From then on, we read of the development not only of Abraham's life, 
but also his personal faith and his relationship with God. And the more his personal relationship with God increased, so did his faith. This relationship, at least in my estimation, up to this point, to Genesis 22, it had been one-sided. God was giving to Abraham. Now God tells Abraham, I want you to give me something back. I want you to give me your son. The Bible in Hebrews chapter 11 identifies him as the monogenesis, the only one of his kind. The only other individual in the Bible that word is used with, of course, in John 3, verse 16, is talking about that of Jesus. God blesses Abraham in spite of the many obstacles that arise. Now God is asking Abraham for something. His son. The same son Abraham had to wait 25 years for. The same son that Abraham and his wife, they prayed about, they struggled to have. Now God is asking him to offer to sacrifice that son. And the Bible says Abraham obeyed God and ultimately led to this conclusion. In Genesis 22, verse 12, the Bible says, he said, Do not reach your hand against the boy and not do anything for him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham knew that he and God had a close relationship. Now... He has truly experienced that for himself. The very thing we often think that is designed to destroy us, the Bible shows us that that is not the case. Because God is, this relationship with God is not only a commitment, but is also built upon trust and acceptance in the one with whom we have the relationship with, that being God. In our world today, we have become very custom to what I like to call convenient obedience. Man, things are going well today. I guess I think I'll be obedient to God. We got everything paid this month. All the bills are paid. Hey, I'm feeling pretty good. Let's keep being obedient to God. Okay, I pass this test. I believe that I'll keep being obedient to God. And that process is never ending. We have somehow determined in our culture, in our world, even in the kingdom of God, we have determined that God is only good to us when things are good. But who are we to define good in his world? And the world has done a great job pushing convenient obedience into our lives and into our homes. Which leads to why many people don't stay with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the world has painted the gospel in a way that because you have obeyed the gospel, man, everything should be great for you. When you read the first century church and the persecutions and all the things they had to suffer and endure, we, we just simply don't find that. But what about inconvenient obedience? Inconvenient obedience is trusting God in spite of the circumstance. I don't concern myself so much with the situation, even though that's hard to say, but I ultimately concern myself with God. And this psalm here was written during a time of enemy invasion. Israel was under attack by their enemies, and they needed God's help, protection, and presence. The psalm was written to encourage a nation to keep faith and to keep hope in God. It is written to offer stability to a people who is shaken by life. It is written to offer hope to a people who felt as if there was no hope. It was written to teach the people of God that there is a refuge, that there is a place of safety to which God's people can flee in times of attack, pain, or sorrow. There is a place we can find peace, protection, and hope. Which brings us to our second point this morning. The psalmist says in Psalm 46, verse 1 again, that God is, notice the next phrase, God is our refuge and strength. The word refuge refers to a shelter or a hiding place from danger. There is your trouble and then there is God. God is the place of safety. As we often sing, he is a shelter in the time of the storm. There is this great cloud of despair and darkness and then there is God. Of other individuals, notice what the Bible says. They are wet with showers of the mountains and embrace the rock for want of shelter. Job 24, verse 8. 
You have shamed the counsel of the poor because the Lord is his refuge, Psalm 14, 6. For there has been a shelter for me and a strong tower for the enemy, Psalm 61, 3. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge. He is my God, Psalm 62, 7. I am as a wonder unto many, but thou art my strong refuge, Psalm 73, 28. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. Psalm 92, 12. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens on the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be with the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Joel 3, 16. If you think back towards the Old Testament, the cities of refuge were part of the distribution of the promised land among the 12 tribes of Israel. The Mosaic law states that anyone who committed a murder was supposed to be put to death, Exodus 21, 14. But for the unintentional deaths, God set aside these cities which murdered could flee for refuge, Exodus 21, 13. These cities of refuge can be also seen as a type of Christ in whom sinners can find refuge from the destroyer of our souls, that being the devil. Just as a person could seek refuge in the cities set up for that purpose, in Hebrews 6, verse 18, the Bible shows us that we flee to Christ as our refuge. The same gospel that saves us from sin is the same gospel that sustains us throughout the trials in our lives. The psalmist says God is our refuge and strength. The word strength refers to his might or his power. God is going to provide. He will simply give us that which we need. When we consider Ephesians chapter 1, 17 and following there, and Paul shows us that the same power our Lord had in resurrecting himself from the grave. Paul says that same power, that same resurrection power is in Christians. He enables us to stand against everything that comes our way. God is a very present help in times of trouble. The word there means to be holy or speedily. He is always there. The God who is our hiding place and the God who is our strength. He is always near and he has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. When you consider Joshua chapter 1, Joshua was having some doubts. The Bible shows us that Moses had just died, and God is saying to Moses, you can do this. And Moses, Joshua that is, God is saying to Joshua, you can do this. And Joshua is saying the opposite, God, I can't do this. And the Bible says in Joshua 1 verse 5, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Verse 7, notice the, redundant, the, the, the redundancy in this text. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. Moses, my servant, commanded thee. What else? Verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Verse 9, have thy now I commanded thee. What else? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee wherever you go. His presence makes the troubles of life bearable. In Daniel 3, King Nebuchadnezzar made that great statement. When you hear the trumpet, when you hear the music, I want you to bow down to my God. And the Bible says in Daniel 3, verse 16, they said, King, we are careful not to answer thee in this matter. Our God whom we serve is able, verse 17, but even if our God doesn't deliver us, we still won't bow down to your God. In Daniel chapter 6, when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, the Bible there says that Daniel was, uh, ultimately, he was able to endure that because God was with him. But notice point number three in verse number two this morning. Again, verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Verse 2, the psalmist says, as a result of God being our refuge and strength, as a result of God being a very present help in time of trouble. Verse 2, the psalmist says, therefore we will not fear. This is not a fear of reverence for God. 
but this is a terror. We will not terror. We will not cower. We will not fret. The psalmist imagines the worst thing that could happen. He envisions the world in which the earth is shaken to its foundations. Again, the Bible says here in verse number two, and though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, Imagine the great mountains of the world. The psalmist says, even if the mountains begin coming down and carrying into the sea, the psalmist says, we won't fear. He sees the world where the mountains slide off into the sea. He sees a scene of utter destruction as flood, water, rage, and the very mountains are shaken from their place or from their foundation. In the midst of all that, the psalmist says, hey, we will not fear. We're not moving. We're not going anywhere. What a declaration of faith and confidence in God that even if something that great can happen, we will not fear. How often do we look at our own foundations and we see cracks? We see the water begins flooding into our homes and we wonder, man, is this it? The scene of a family sitting on a couch so it doesn't be rolled away by the water. The scenes of cars driving as fast as they can to get out of danger. Knowing destruction is behind you and the only way out is forward or through. While the destruction or the situation seems out of control, far beyond the horizon, there's God. Waiting for us to get to him. There is hope and then there is God. The psalmist declares this hope in verse 4. He says, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. He describes a river that flows through the city of God, that being Jerusalem. However, we know the Bible shows us, history shows us that there is no a river that flows through this city. The psalmist, I believe, is speaking of a river that will exist someday into the future. He is looking forward to a time when God will transform not just the city of Jerusalem, but ultimately the kingdom of God. I think there is more to his prophetic words here than just a glimpse into, into the physical Jerusalem, that is. The psalmist, I believe, is referring to a river of grace that, fro that flows from the Lord unto his people. He refuses to be afraid because of the peace of God, like a mighty river is flowing from God to those who trust in him. The same river flows to those who will rest in his grace. He is able to give abundant in his grace. Verse 5, the psalmist says, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her in the right early. When God is with us, peace prevails in our heart, in the hearts of his people. When we think of Psalm 1, he is like a tree planted by the rivers of the water. Psalm 23, he leadeth me beside still waters. He restores my soul. How can we walk unafraid? How can we walk through the mountains and not be bothered? In Job 23, verse 10, the Bible says, But he knows our way. When he has tried us, we shall come forth as go. In Isaiah 46, 9 through 11, the prophet there says he plans our ways. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, there Moses said he clears our ways. God knows our ways. God plans our ways, and he also clears our ways. I think that covers everything. In Psalm 46, verse 6, the Bible said the heathen raised, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. David shows us the Lord's power. With one word, he is able to melt the earth. The wicked are not in control, brethren. God is. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Ephesians 2, verse 20. In Job chapter 26, when Job is responding to Bildad from chapter 25, Job gives us a chapter, 14 verses of the power of God. The Bible says in verse 1, Job 26 verse 1, But Job answered and said, How hast thou helped him that is without power? How savest thou to the arm thou have no strength? How hast thou counseled him that have no wisdom? How hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is? To whom hast thou uttered words? In whose spirit came from thee, verse 5, dead things are formed under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. 
He says, Hades is naked before him, and the destruction it have no covering. Verse 7, Job says, he stretched out the earth upon nothing. He binds up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. His conclusion in verse 14 is, lo, these are only parts of his ways, but how little a portion is known of him. Well, Job, what's your conclusion of all this? But the thunder of his power, who can understand? There is a fortress in God's promise. He says in verse 8, come behold the works of the Lord. What desolation he hath made in the earth. The first word in this verse is come. God created everything so it might manifest him. Psalm 19 verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament it showeth his handiwork. The psalmist invites us to consider all the great things God has done. He has his demonstrated in his power and ability countless of times. And the devil wants to use trials and pressures to turn your hearts away from God. So questions like these often arise. If God really cared, why did he allow this to happen? What is the use of serving him? The devil will even say, man, you've been faithful, you've been good, you've done everything God has asked you to do. Look at what God is doing to you. The same lies he told those in the Bible are the same lies he tells today. Even if the world is falling apart, know that God is on his throne. God is at work in your life if you have life. In Psalm 46, verse 10, the Bible says, He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth up the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in fire. Be still, verse 10, and know that I am God. The psalmist says, can you sit still long enough and remind yourself that God is God? When you come and behold the glory, you will... Uh, come and see his work. And then you come to realize that God is really good at being God. Pharaoh tried in Exodus chapter 5, 1 and 2 to overtake God, but God humbled him. And Acts chapter 9, 1 through 5, Saul, isn't it hard for you to kick against the pricks? When you find yourself fighting against God, know that you are fighting a losing battle. Moses asked a very important question, who is on the Lord's side? The question will be answered by every generation. Those who choose God will be vindicated. They will be victorious. And again, when you read Hebrews chapter 11, all those names, all those faithful people, you look at all those generations and they chose right. Enoch walked with God, the world did not. Noah, he walked with God, the world did not. Abraham allowed his faith to speak volumes for him, the world did not. Those prophets who were faithful, they, they did right. They chose God and God chose them. We choose God, brethren, because God chooses us. What can we do this morning? Our faith is shaken. The foundation is broken. What can we do this morning? Number one, practice your faith. One of the best things you can do, we can do for ourselves and for our family, is profess our faith. But what does that look like? It's not hard. Husband loves your wife. Wife loves your husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. The Bible shows us in ways in which or, or how we can profess our faith. Attend worship services. Pray persistently. Serve your brothers and sisters. Guard your heart. Let it be known and clearly understood that the practice of the faith or the faith faithfully practiced, it shows your faith. Practice your faith. Number two, fight with your faith. Timothy is losing some battles. Paul tells them to get back in there, fight, keep going. We often like to fight with man-made devices and with man-made solutions. Brethren, fight with your faith. In Psalm 11, in verse number three, Psalm 11, verse one, in the Lord put out my trust, how say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain, for lo, the wicked bend their bow. They may ready their arrow upon the stream, that they may privilege shoot at the upright in heart. Verse 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. We trust God in this family. That's what we do. Faith is trusting God and doing what he says. Teach and model that to everyone around you. 
if no one else around you is going to live like that, you live like that. Hey, man, hey, we trust God. That's what we do. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. We have to model that. We have to show that. The Bible shows us in Joshua 24, verse 15, hey, we trust God in this house. When? When things are good, we trust God. When things are bad, we trust God. We're barely making it. We don't have enough money. What do we do? We trust God. What about when we suffer loss? We get sick. We trust God. What about when natural disaster strikes? We trust God. What about when the world is falling apart? We trust God. What about when I don't know what to do? Hey, we trust God. That's what we do. We live in a world that is divided, and they hate each other. But Christians, we trust God. What our young people need to see is not people who cower and complain every time something bad happens. They need to see mature, faithful people who trust God. That's what we do. Christianity is not about human perfection. It's about Christ's perfection. It's not about our goodness, but it's about God's grace. It's not about us being made complete, but it is about us being made complete in Christ. Christianity is not about flawlessness. It is about faithfulness. Sometimes we fail. We fall. We stumble. We struggle. We get back up. We keep trying. God is telling David, yes, you can. And that is God's call to all of his children. Yes, you can. Abraham, yes, you can offer your son. Job, yes, you can endure anything Satan throws at you. Moses, yes, you can go back to Egypt. Joshua, yes, you can march around the walls. Sarah, yes, you can have a child. Peter, yes, you can come back. And guess what? I'll be with you every step of the way. What do I do when my faith is tested? What do I do when my faith is shaken? I remind myself that God, it's my refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Verse 2, therefore, we will not fear. Who is with me every step of the way? Who is with me when no one physically is around me? When Joseph sat in that prison for all those years, he probably often thought he was alone. But God was with him. The psalmist begins... And end this psalm with God. He says in verse number 10 again, Be still, know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Verse 11, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob, he is our refuge. He is our refuge. He is our fortress. And he is our strength. The Bible shows us the reality of life and death, and everything that is associated with that. A father went to his son and asked his son, what was he going to do after college? The son said, well, I guess I'll graduate, get married, just kind of live my life. The father said, that's great, but what are you going to do after that? So I guess I'll find a job, you know, I'll live, try to save for retirement, Maybe go back to school again, do the very best I can. The father said, that's great, but what will you do after that? And the son ultimately said, well, I guess I'll die. And the father asked him, what are you going to do after that? You see, this morning, I don't know what many of us are going through. I don't know what our intentions always are, especially with our relationship with God. It's rocky. It's tough sometimes. But we need to know the answer to the and then what after this life. What are you going to do about death? What are you going to do about sin? What are you going to do about the judgment? I often like to say it, because I think it's always applicable for every lesson. That's just me. Death is coming, friend. Make no mistake about it. You need to get to Jesus before death gets to you. This morning, God has provided us an opportunity to make that right. We know that God is our everything. We know that God is our refuge and strength. We know that God is there with us. He's there for us, Hebrews 13, 5. And we know that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. But we have to make the decision to be where he is. Are you not a Christian this morning? You have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ to be saved from your sins. You have to become a member of his family, gain access through the gospel, 
and to that kingdom, that being the church. The book of Acts, it teaches us multiple times how individuals uh, came to know Jesus and came to respond to that gospel. On the day of Pentecost, the conclusion is, what shall we do? Peter told them, repent and be baptized, and you shall, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift uh, of the Holy Spirit. This morning, the kingdom of God is waiting for you. God is waiting for you to be a part of that kingdom. But if we have already named the name of Christ, and we've already realized this morning that we have made mistakes and we have messed up, man, you are not by yourself. I think Sunday is often the day we try to hide what's wrong with us because we don't want other people to know we're struggling and we're going through things. But as a family, we can share those things with each other. And we'll pray with you and we'll pray for you. And we will be there to help you to the end. This morning, we can help you. We invite you to come while we stand and while we sing. Number 784. 784. We'll sing this all to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. Sing all three verses. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the Just like 
Good morning. Good morning. Is there anyone that still needs a communion packet? We've just sung, Why did my Savior come to earth? Because he loved me so. St. John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe it in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for us. We read of his sufferings in Isaiah chapter 53. It tells us how long he suffered, the depth of his suffering. But he did it because he loved us. He has done so much in his suffering for us, and what he requires of us is to remember his sufferings, to remember his death, to remember his burial, and to remember his resurrection when we meet on a day like today. So according to Acts chapter 20, verse 7, if we ask the question, when, we are told upon the first day of the week. If we ask the question, how, we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, from about verse 23, Jesus Christ himself instituted the Lord's Supper. We are told to... We see where he broke bread with his disciples. He gave it to them. They ate in remembrance of him. This is what we are required to do this morning. And so as we gather as a church family, we need to take a detailed look in our lives. We need to use this opportunity to reflect. We need to take this opportunity to remember his death, his burial, his resurrection. And so we'll take a few minutes to remember. I'll read a few verses, and then we have a prayer, and we partake of the bread. Matthew 26, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples. And he said, take, 
eat. This is my body. Let us pray for the bread. Almighty God, as we come before you this morning, we come thanking you for your son, Jesus Christ, all his sufferings. We come to remember his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We pray, dear Father, that as we have this opportunity to do so through partaking of the bread, we pray, God, that as we examine ourselves, as we look back on all his suffering, that as your children, O oh God, we will partake in a worthy manner. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue to reflect, verse 27, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us continue praying for the cup. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cup, which represents the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that he was willing to be crucified on that cruel cross of Calvary. As we partake of this cup, dear God, Pray that we do so in remembrance of him. Through his name we pray. Amen. Amen. We've concluded our Lord's Supper and we will shift our focus to giving. It is also required of us to give on the first day of the week according to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. We are also told to give according as we purpose, according as we prosper. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 8. So as we give this morning, let us remember that we give not sparingly, but we give bountifully because God loves a cheerful giver. If you haven't gotten the chance to put your offerings when you leave, we have the plates here for you to leave your offerings in. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for life that you have given us. We thank you, O God, for abilities that you have given us, abilities that we have used in our respective lives to earn a living. We thank you, dear God, for those blessings. And we pray, God, that we will understand that nothing that we earn, nothing that we own is ours, dear Father. It's all because of you. And so as we come to give, dear Father, I pray, God, that we will think seriously about our giving, we will give as we prosper, and we will give as we purpose in our hearts. We thank you for our elders, and we pray, God, that as they are the ones who are accountable for this giving, we pray, God, that they, through you, will use it for the building up of your kingdom here on earth. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hymn number 755 will be our final song this morning. After this song, we'll have our closing prayer. If you're able to, please stand for this song. We certainly appreciate Josh for his ability to proclaim God's word to us this morning. So easy for us to understand, but also challenging to the heart. If you're visiting with us, we appreciate you. And we want to let you know that we meet again tonight at 6 p.m. and on Wednesdays at 7. Number 755, we'll sing the first verse, and then we'll have a closing prayer. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saints of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Pray with me. Father of heaven, Father of all creation, and praying in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the only name under heaven where salvation can be obtained. And we thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit that guides us in your word. We thank you for the church that Jesus gave his life for. And we pray, Father, that when that day comes, uh, he gathers that church to heaven that we can go with him and we pray father for the sick in our congregation for kathy at this time and others who have been mentioned we know lord that uh, spiritual sickness and physical sickness can be things that hold us down lord and we just pray that you help us with those things continue to be with our elders give them wisdom and knowledge lord that they may uh, be our shepherds, that it may lead us in paths of righteousness for our deacons who do the things that they are assigned and take care of those things, Father, that we can best our lives also. Be with the ministers of this congregation, Lord. Always bless them and their families. Give them strength, physical and spiritual, always, Lord. Go with us as we leave this place. Help us, Father, that we can return. Just give us your strength. We thank you for all that you do in our lives, O oh, Lord. You do so many things that I think sometimes we just don't give you enough credit for those. Have mercy on us all this day and throughout our lives, Lord. And when that day comes, take us home to be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>